Hello, this is Joe Hartman of intraoperativeneuromonitoring.com and from Sentient Medical. This is the last video of the CNIM crash course. This one's going to cover EEG monitoring. So electroencephalography, spontaneous electrical activity of the brain recorded with electrodes on the scalp, generally recorded from a number of sites simultaneously using electrodes distributed over the scalp due to summated activity of a large group of neurons usually for studying the basic features of sleep, coma, epilepsy, and brain death in the operating room to determine the level of metabolic activity of the brain. It's useful for monitoring vascular surgeries for ischemia, and it may be useful for monitoring neural protection during aneurysm clipping. Uh, see that I did not put depths of anesthesia on there. What causes cortical activity monitored as EEG? EEG potentials are caused by electric current flow due to summated activity of excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials at dendritic synapses, so it's not due to action potentials, found in the fifth layer of the cortex, the pyramidal cells. The rapidly changing potential difference between one point on the scalp and the other seen in EEGs is due to these voltage fluctuations. A potentially or a potential usually represents thousands of cells contributing their small voltages. The electrical potential difference recorded between two electrodes reflect weighted contributions from all current sources within the medium, so strong activity at the long distances will be slightly influential. The recorded signal comes mainly from the neurons near the tip of the electrode and only to a small extent from more distant neurons. So that's an important piece of information that that last part is we are recording over just the most distal area close to the uh, recording uh, electrode. So we don't have a whole lot of uh, gross coverage. That's why we use so many different electrodes for EEGs because we're taking like small little snippets of area and recording that the dendritic activity over that uh, specific area. Dipole orientation. At any given moment, a tremendous amount of dipoles are active in the body. EEG makes it possible to determine the location and strength of a few principal dipoles, those that are the major contributors to generation of an electric field. Since a dipole has opposite charges, its orientation is important. A vertical or, or radial dipole is oriented from the center of the brain surface. A horizontal or tangential dipole is oriented parallel to the brain surface. A current dipole's potential varies inversely as, as the square of the distance from source and depends on the angle from the dipole axis. So here we have two images here, one showing a dipole where the negative polarity is going straight out towards the cortex, and the other is being created by one of those sulcus where it is uh, has more of a central or medial negative dipole. And you can look to see the different locations of the recording electrodes and the effect it has on that uh, electrode potential, either being a decrease or an increase in amplitude or even an inversion in the amplitude. After filtering out noise, unwanted signals outside the desired amplitude and frequency ranges, waveforms are continuously displayed. The frequency and power of the microcurrent can be recorded. The frequency of the waveform gives clues as to the metabolic activity of the cortex near the recording electrodes. So if we look at the picture on the, the left side here, it's A is the human brain, picture B is a section of the cerebral cortex showing microcurrent sources due to synaptic and action potentials. Neurons are actually much more closely packed than shown, about 10 to the fifth neurons per millimeter squared of surface. Each scalp EEG electrode records space averages over many square centimeters of cortical surface. A four second epoch of alpha rhythm is, and its corresponding power st uh, spectrum are shown. So here we have the raw EEG for four seconds. <clears throat> here we have it broken down into how much power or amplitude uh, per waveform and frequency. So we can see that in the alpha range, we have the, the dominant and large, uh, largest amplitude uh, occurrence in that range there. SSCP potentials, these are small action potentials relays on uh, that rely on single 
small dipoles. These potentials are 0.5 to 3 microvolts in size. EEG potentials generated by postsynaptic potentials that extend over large areas with layers of dipoles. This field of potential is less susceptible to deterioration of the wave from the distance of the electrode on the scalp. The size of the potentials are 10 to 50 microvolts in size, and the duration lasts around 10 to 250 microseconds compared to one to two microseconds. I'm sorry, I'm saying micro, it's milliseconds compared to one to two milliseconds for the action potentials. So there is more overlap in potentials. Please note that EEG amplitudes during anesthesia are considerably less than those encountered during routine EEGs. This requires that the EEG be viewed at an increased sensitivity, usually two to three microvolts per minute. Our anesthesiologist says again with you, uh, don't worry, I've already got my infusion pump ready for TIVA. So when we look at the progression of anesthesia with inhalational agents, uh, induction demonstrates a shift of occipitally dominant alpha to frontal regulation. Most agents produce an initial excitation characterized by desynchronization and a loss of synaptic inhibitory function. So that's an important sense there. Initially, you get the inhalation on board. It gets more excited because of loss of inhibitory function, and there's also decre uh, desynchronization uh, alongside with it. Next, the EEG becomes synchronized with a predominance in the alpha range. So if we look at the picture here, we go from awake to light anesthesia to deep and the mean EEG frequency. So in the very beginning, while we're awake, we have a very high frequency and it's disorganized. We put on the initial, uh, so this is the, the initial anesthesia coming on. We become even more desynchronized, a little bit faster in uh, frequency. And then we move into light anesthesia where we get high amplitude. It's now more uh, well organized. This is the area that we usually like to monitor when we are in, uh, well, the, this general area is where we like to monitor when we're doing something like carotids where we want a steady state anesthetic uh, in the alpha beta range. If we go a little bit deeper on the anesthesia, then we start to see some slowing. So we will call that something like delta or theta wave intrusion. Those are slower waveforms that uh, will mimic areas of brains that might be less perfused than they functionally or structurally uh, need to in order to survive. So that's why we want anesthesia to be at that constant steady state uh, level so we can determine if it's anesthetic or if it's uh, ischemic in nature. If we keep going down, now we have uh, gotten rid of all the fast activity, all the alpha and betas, and we just have delta waves with some theta waves overriding it. We keep progressing down. We come into burst suppression, which is moments of isoelectric or the EEG looks flat with uh, intermittent burst of activity that can have different frequency waveforms in it. And then at the deepest, we have silence or isoelectric EEG. Now in real life, it does not take this nice smooth curve all the way down. We might see the patient awake. We have this fast activity, put on the propofol, start to, they intubate them, put on some gas, you click it on, and then all of a sudden you're all the way down in burst suppression. So it doesn't have this smooth little transition. It can kind of jump pretty rapidly. Seven stages of EEG during anesthesia. Normal attentive state of person the EEG generally shows a low activity, and these states of relaxation, drowsiness, and sleep, amplitude grows and frequency drops. If a person is anesthetized, generally the same effect occurs, an increase in amplitude and slowing rhythmic activity. States of the anesthesia first is a flat pattern, low amplitude. The pre uh, present and normal state has disappeared. Second is rhythmical, high amplitude, sub-alpha activity. Third is complex pattern, slower activity, and amplitude begins to fall. Four is slight suppression, decreasing amplitude in short periods like two seconds of flat patterns. Five is moderate suppression, flat EEG for periods of about five seconds. This is a longer duration burst suppression. Six is severe suppression. The wave groups do not appear more than once every zero seconds. And then seven is complete suppression of measurable waves. This general scheme is mainly applicable to volatile anesthetics. And again, we have a graph over here showing from the awake to the deep and an anesthetized person. OK, 
Okay, here we have an EEG pattern related to A, anesthesia induction, and then B, decreasing levels of anesthesia. Note the frontal intermittent rhythmic delta activity that occurs with induction associated with generalized background slowing. So that is this area here, this frontal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. And then in this picture here, it starts to become a little bit more widespread, and then it starts to dissipate out. Dose-dependent changes in EEG. With rapid induction, the beta frequency activity may be intermixed with burst of high-amplitude frontal intermittent rhythmic delta activity, or uh, FIRDA, FIRDA pattern, with a slower rate of induction with non-barbiturate inh inhalational agents, there is less tendency towards intermittent rhythmic bursting. With a light, steady-state anesthesia, Alpha waves become, the prom, uh, become prevalent along with beta activity. Anterior maximum rhythmic fast uh, or ARF pattern or widespread anterior maximal rhythm, WAR, usually in the lower beta or alpha frequency range is seen. In humans, the anesthetic ARF pattern tends to be more continuous than normal sleep spindles. So, these three definitions, these patterns, this uh, FIRDA, the WAR, the ARF, these are questions that they like to ask. Here are pictures of them and here are definitions. Make sure you spend some time on the slide to understand what it looks like, where it's more prominent, and what uh, anesthetic, like this non barbiturate inhal inhalational, what causes it. Anterior intermittent slow waves, or AIS, are commonly diphasic, having a sharply contoured negative positive configuration with duration of less than one second, occurring singularly in it or in trains. They are anteriorly maximum intermittent slow wave activities, and here we have a picture of it. Widespread persistent slow waves. These are polymorphic slow waves with a persistent slow wave activity with low amplitudes expressed maximally over the temporal and posterior regions with a duration usually greater than one second, most prominent with isoflurane. With an increase in anesthetic level, there is an increase in amplitude and wavelengths of the WPS pattern and a decrease in war pattern, like we see down here. Moderate anesthesia uh, begins to show a dropping off of fast frequencies, the beta alpha, and an increase in slower frequencies, the theta uh, delta, along with a decrease in the amplitude size of faster frequencies. Deep anesthesia causes burst suppression or isoelectric EEGs. Anesthesia may be obscured, may obscure an abnormality that was present during the waking traces and may also activate an abnormality that is minimal or not apparent during the waking state. So that last one, all it means is when you put anesthesia on board, it can unmask some area of uh, inactivity or deficit area. Uh, the complete opposite can happen as well, where now you uh, hide something that was a deficit before they went to sleep. So that gets back to, should we be doing uh, pre-anesthetic baselines for EEGs? Um, in the guidelines, it said we should for that very reason where it unmasks or uh, hides specific areas. For me, I don't know what relevant information that gives you during the intraoperative case. Add that to the fact that we typically do not run a full EEG head lead uh, montage so we're looking at very small, uh, small spaces or we're not, we don't have as many points to measure from. So again, trying to fo find focal deficits is not as uh, imperative or, or something we can even do as well when we have our typical EEG setup for carotids. All right, next one, nine. If there is a preoperative unilateral anterior hemispheric insult, the anesthetic record may show a major decrease in the AR, ARF pattern and an increase in the irregular slowing of the region. And here we have the waves and what they uh, look for as far as amp what they look like as far as amplitude size and its speed. 
So betas is the fastest, which actually has a smaller amplitude than alpha. So when we're moving from uh, different frequencies from beta to alpha, we will see a reduction in, or I'm sorry, an increase in amplitude size. But if we're having a reduc reduction in the beta waves from anesthesia, the beta waves that we're seeing will also have a decrease in amplitude. So it, it's kind of difficult to decipher. When we add anesthesia, the beta waves that are present are becoming less and less present, and they're becoming smaller in amplitude. As they move from uh, that fast beta frequency down to alpha, they will become alpha waves, but, and those generally have larger amplitudes. But if we isolated out the beta versus alpha waves, then we can tell the difference in the decreasing amplitude of each. And then same goes down the line. Look how big these delta waves are. Barbiturates versus opioids with EEGs. So increasing plasma concentrations of thiopental, thiopental or fentanyl produces a characteristic progression of changes on the EEG. In stage one, the frequency and amplitude of waveforms increase. Uh, so we see the thiopental, thiopental. In stage two, both drugs produce a decrease in frequency and an increase in amplitude. In stage three, thiopental produces burst suppression pattern and finally isoelectric EEG. Fentanyl has its maximal effect in stage three, that is large slow delta waves. So here we can see different patterns that different medications have on your EEG patterns. So this is a knock against, should we use EEGs for depth of anesthesia? Well, when we do anesthesia, we typically don't just have one medication on board. We have a couple on board, and they are in varying uh, levels, even throughout the procedure. And each patient will handle each of those medications differently. And then you go to the next facility, and they're running a completely different anesthetic protocol. So to be able to say that, oh, somebody in stage one on here is okay, but stage one over here is, you know, maybe they're a little deeper. Uh, it's you're really just playing a guessing game. Uh, same thing goes for anesthetics chosen for certain case types, like for doing a, an aneurysm clipping. We want something that induces that uh, isoelectric or burst suppression sooner. Something like Crocfall works great on those when we want neuroprotection. But if we're doing something like a uh, carotid endorectomy, we want to stay away from those drugs. I personally do not like to have it propofol on those cases. I'd much rather have around a MAC of gas and a fentanyl. That seems to give great uh, fast alpha slow beta, uh, uh, you know, not changing waveforms throughout the case, pretty steady state. And that's exactly what you want going into the procedure right before they clamp. Okay, EEGs, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can fill out this going into uh, the next slide. Okay, here we go. The ACNS in 2006 had says 21 channels, no less than 8 to 12, to channel, 8 to 12 channels is appropriate for EEG monitoring. E impedance less than 5,000 ohms, greater than 100 ohms, no channels with uh, greater than 2,000 ohms in between each other. Band pass a low cut 0 0.3 to 1 hertz and a high cut 35 to 70 hertz. Paper speed of 30 millimeters per second is the typical speed that most people are used to looking at. Sometimes I switch back and forth. I'll sometimes go uh, one second per division, and then that gives me a better clue as to what frequency the waveforms are in, because I can just count the turns. And then I'll go back to 30 millimeters per second, because that's uh, just what myself and most oversight physicians are used to looking at when they're looking for changes in EEG pattern. Sensitivity is 3 microvolts uh, per millimeter and no notch filter. The International 1020 system, like I said in a previous slide, this is something that you just have to commit to memory. Not only the location points, but how, how much distance and percentage is in between each electrode. And if they gave you a specific number and distance to be able to figure out what that number would be by plugging it into your percentages.
The letters F, T, C, P, and O stand for frontal, temporal, central, parietal, and occipital lobes, respectively. Note that there exists no central lobe. The letter C is used only for identification purposes or the central area. A Z or a zero refers to an electrode placed on the midline. Even numbers uh, are on the right side, whereas odds are on the left side. The letters A, P, G, and F, P identify earlobes, nasopharyngeal, and frontal polar sites, respectively. And then we have a chart saying pretty much the same thing on the left there, as well as the uh, key at the bottom of this picture. Referential versus bipolar montage. Referential montage has each different active channel with a similar reference electrode. The reference is theoretically inactive, but is still active to some degree. The bipolar montage has recording over two active electrodes. Referential is usually used in diagnostic labs. Bipolar is usually in the operating room. Electrodes set up anterior to posterior is recommended. Use the same linkage from right to left in order to assess symmetry. So in the upper picture and the upper right, that's more your diagnostic lab. They're looking for spike inversion and, and they want to identify focal seizure places and where exactly it's happening in the cortex versus in the operating room, we're using this anterior to posterior uh, right versus left symmetrically oriented double banana is what it's uh, also called. And they, they will use that term on the CNIM. Uh, that's the montage we're looking for because we're looking for more gross ischemic changes and just trying to decipher it's left versus right or if it's frontal versus parietal. Referential versus bipolar montage. Referential montage typically uses A1, A2 as a reference. CZ is active during sleep. Referential may, uh, may pick up more artifact. As the distance between the bipolar electrodes increases, signals grow more strong. However, the noise increases by the same rate as well. Bipolar montages may demonstrate phase reversal in neighboring channels or the opposite simultaneous deflection of waves in channels that contain a common electrode. Bipolar montages help resolve ambiguous findings on referential montages due to inactive reference. So after they find something on their referential montage, they will uh, look at their bipolar and try to get a bigger, a better overall picture. So the pictures on the right, we look at the uh, normal EG in A, we're looking at the bottom right uh, in the lower area. The bipolar montage demonstrates phase reversal. And in B, the referential montage demonstrating absolute voltage. Referential montage depiction of a focal discharge. The oval around the T4 electrode indicates the maximum negative field for a focal discharge and the concentric larger oval indicates the field's extent. The A2 electrode is beyond the oval, so it is relatively neutral. The channel produces, produced by F8 to A2 has an upward deflection because F8 is negative compared to the un, uninvolved A2 electrode. The same is true for the channel produced by T6 to A2. The channel produced by T4 to A2 is an upward, but is upward, but the amplitude is greater than the amplitude for either the F8 to A2 or the T6 to A2 channel because the difference in amplitude between T4 and A2 is greater than the distance between either F8 or T6 and A2. The higher amplitude in the T4 to A2 channel indicates the field is focal at T4 despite the extension of the field to include F8 and T6 electrodes. This is the bipolar montage depiction of the focal discharge. The field is the same as the previous picture with the maximum at the T4 electrode and the distribution that includes the F8 and T6 electrode. The FP2 to F8 and the F8 to T4 channels both have a downward deflection because the F8 is more negative than FP2 and T4 is more negative than F8. The more negative electrodes occur in each pair of uh, pairs first position in the T4 to T6 and T6 to O2 channel. So the deflection and upward is seen in these channels. The maximum negative field appears as a phase reversal, opposing deflection across the T4 electrode. So the field is focal in T4 and extends to include the F8 and T6 electrodes. Determining whether the FP2 
and O2 electrodes are also included in the field would require pairing each with electrodes that are more distant from the T4 electrode. So I was just thinking back to a couple slides ago, I believe I said referential had the uh, phase reversal where it, it, that's not correct. It should be the uh, bipolar has the phase reversal as we see here, referential has the increasing amplitude size. Bipolar montage depiction of a broad focal discharge. The maximum negative field includes both the F8 and T4 electrodes, so the F8 T4 channel output is flat because the differential amplification results in cancellation of signal that is equivalent to in the two electrodes. However, the negative field is evident at the F8 electrode in the FP2 to F8 channels, downward deflection, and the T4 electrode in the T4 to T6 channels, upward deflection. The broad field results in a phase reversal between the FP2, F8, and the T4, T6 channels across the F8, T4 channel. And the isoelectric channel confirms that the field center includes two electrode locations. The International Federation of Society for EEG and Clinical Neurophysiology state that the number of channels that we should have in monitoring is no less than eight channels of simultaneously re recording be used and that a larger number of channels is encouraged. The full 21 electrode placement of the 1020 system should be used. According to ASET, a minimum of 16 channels should be used whenever possible. However, 21 or more channels is optimal for EEG surgical testing since it allows recording of additional parameters such as electrocardiographic and muscle potentials. <coughs> the ACNS in 2006 revisions of the original AEEGS 1994 diagnostic guidelines still recommend 21 channels. Specifically addressing intraoperative monitoring, only four channels may be adequate if a lateralized channel or an interhemispheric asymmetry is the only desired information. And then another one says IOM recordings equals bipolar, anterior to posterior, 16 channel montage was produced since this derivation is less prone to artifact and electrical interference and gives easily appreciated interhemisphere comparative data. So you can see that there are a number of different recommendations for how many channels we should be using for EEG monitoring. So you're going to want to read the question first and figure out what they're going after. Uh, I would assume no less than eight channels on any question being asked, even though that there's that one uh, study in the guidelines that says you can use four if all you're doing is looking for uh, interhemispheric asymmetry. And chances are they might be looking for more. 8, 12, 16, and 21 are the numbers used. So if you see 17 channels, that's probably not right. Um, this is one of those ones where we don't get feedback on what the actual correct answer is. And because there's so many different recommendations, I honestly have no idea what the best answer would be if A was 8, B was 12, C was 16, and uh, D was 21. I know the standard protocol is probably 8. That's, I, that's what I'm assuming most groups are using on this exam. And because of all the different recommendations, 21 is probably best. So if they're saying what's optimal or what's best, then 21. If they're saying uh, what's the minimal or uh, what's the least amount that you can be used, then maybe I would select eight. DTAB, that's how I remember the frequencies of EEGs from delta, theta, alpha, beta, going from left to right is slow to fast. So the delta, and <clears throat> when they ask you about these delta waves, they wanna know their uh, frequency bandwidth. So they wanna know the delta is 0 0.5 to four hertz and so forth. They wanna know that you know the uh, Roman uh, letter or whatever it is, the you know the alpha sign, the beta sign. They want to know where, you, if you know where it's predominant in the awake patient. Um, so we have that information here, as well as they want you to be able to identify the pattern uh, of raw EG on the screen. So the delta wave has the frequency range of 0 0.5 to 4 hertz and are detectable in infants and sleeping adults. The theta waves have a frequency range of 4 to 8 hertz and are obtained from children and sleeping adults. The alpha waves have the frequency spectrum of 8 to 13 hertz and can be measured from the occipital region in the awake person when the eyes are closed. The frequency band of the beta waves is 13 to 30 hertz. 
These are detectable over the parietal and frontal lobes, increased with barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Eyeball, uh, I'm sorry, eyeballing raw data may be the best way for a trained professional to monitor all the channels in real time. So if you have to choose between raw EEG or uh, some of this other EEG that's gone through an algorithmic uh, equation, you want to choose the raw EEG. So the way you figure out how fast the waves are going is you count the waves in a one second epoch to find the classification of EEG. Note the more intense cortical mental activity, the smaller the amplitude and the higher the frequency of EEG waves. The less intense the mental activity, the more synchronous the activation of cortical neurons, leading to slower waves and larger amplitudes. So like we said, that beta is real fast, disorganized, small amplitude keep going down and drowsiness and sleepiness and we start getting that uh, less frequent larger amplitude uh, more discernible or synchronous waveforms eeg frequency sleep versus anesthesia so there are some similarities when a person goes from uh, an awake thought process to the point of deep sleep uh, that mimics the awake thought process person going through deep anesthesia Similarities, but not exactly the same. So alpha frequencies are more prominent in the occipital area. That's a good thing to know. Whereas beta frequencies are most uh, seen in the frontal regions. Also good to know. During sleep, a combination of theta and slow delta activity dominates the EEG patterns. So in the picture on the right here, we see the alertness all the way going down to sleep. So stage A is the EEG stage, or A has A1. High, oxip a high occipital EEG alpha pattern go down a little bit more, high frontal and occipital EEG pattern down a little bit more, high frontal EEG pattern. We start to get a little bit more sleepy, the desynchronized low amplitude EEGs, high EEG delta and theta power, and then K complexes or spindle activities. Spindle activities should be uh, recognized with sleep patterns. The awake person has a high frequency, low amplitude wave that dominates, mostly beta. EMG interference from facial and ocular muscles is common and results in both wandering baselines and extraneous high amplitude, high frequency activities. Blinks are represented by a sharp deflection and then an exponential return to baseline. Eye movements create a large deflection to both sides of the baselines before returning. Smiling and grimacing generates increased high frequencies activity from facial and temporalis muscles. The EEG looks fuzzy because the individual fast waves are of low amplitude and blurred together uh, when you display the sweep speed of 25 millimeters per second. And the classic rhythm of relaxed wakefulness is predominantly occipital and not commonly seen using frontal electrodes in anxious preoperative patients. So on the right side here we have uh, different EEG artifact patterns uh, from muscle activity, the, the blinks versus no blinks and some EMG activity versus strong contraction of a muscle and so forth. The sedated or becoming anesthetized person. As the sedative or hypnotic drug concentration increases, there is consistent sequence of EEG changes. Initially, there, there's an increase in the amplitude of the frontal EEG with deeper sedation, the activity slows to spindle-like waves and then slows further to the range with the loss of uh, those, those waves and amplitudes. Spindles are considered the hallmark of non-rapid eye movement sleep and are believed to mediate many sleep-related functions. So when you see a spindle, uh, as shown in the very top picture here, we have spindles here and then we have some more spindles here. This is that non-rapid eye movement state of sleep. <clears throat> and here, this picture does a pretty good uh, description of labeling things when they're in spindles or delta and theta activity and longer continuous strands of spindles. So it, that's a, a good picture to study, to try to get used to what you're looking at and then relate it to where the patient is uh, as far as their level of sedation or sleepiness. Burst suppression. Spindles appear during sleep and, and are defined by one to three seconds of periods of waxing and waning at a frequency of seven to four hertz. 
usually su superimposed over other EG waves, usually occurs after the burst, but may be seen during longer times of suppression, seen in deep, deep anesthesia. So we can see our isoelectric, we have this huge burst, and then we have following spindles or following spindles in the examples there. How come we're seeing the same spindles recordings seen in sleep cycles? So propofol inhalational agents suppress action potentials and hyperpolarize cortical thalamic cells, same as slow wave sleep. Cortical thalamic cells stop firing continuously and begin firing in burst. The EEG manifests as this low as this appearance of short bursts of activity with a frequency of around 714 hertz, which wax and wane over time. In the context of sleep, these waves are called sleep spindles, and they are the hallmark of natural sleep onset. Similar spindle-like activity is seen with anesthesia. Spindles tend to be synchronous across the cortex, and therefore, will, uh, therefore less will be detected if the EEG electrodes are positioned close together in a bipolar fashion. Just as spindle activity in EG heralds the onset of natural sleep, in the setting of general anesthesia, the appearance of spindle-like activity should coincide with patients becoming unconscious due to anesthetic drugs. And again, we have patterns of these sleep spindles. The awake versus the anesthetized patient. Uh, in that picture, we have the beta versus alpha. Beta is typically seen in the awake patient whereas alpha is typically seen in the anesthetized or lightly anesthetized uh, patient. Beta waves are faster, but will typically have a uh, larger amplitude. No, that's incorrect. Will typically have smaller amplitudes. They may actually look like patients is getting more excited, even though the patient is on their way to progressively slower frequencies. Here we have EEG artifacts. Opposite of the EKG waves, regular intervals, similar morphology, synchronous volume conductance picked up in the referential montage. So we're first we're looking for the artifact as highlighted in this box. And then we typically, okay, it's not on these slides, but usually they will have a, a referenced electrode to something on the head. And that is where we're gonna look for our, our EKG artifacts but we don't have it on this, uh, these slides here. They got cut off, but we can see this rhythmic EKG artifact here. We can see this less than rhythmic, uh, different amplitude waveform EMG artifact, and then this U-shaped in the frontal area where the eyeball is when you, when you blink. So the eyeball itself has its own dipole where it uh, rolls up into your head as you close your eyes, and then back down as you open it, which causes that U-shape. Electrode pop artifact. We see a sudden change in potential of electrode scalp confined to that lead itself. So here we're looking at the F8 lead, which is the common lead having that electrode pop artifact. 60 Hertz artifact seen in electrodes with high impedance. So again, chances are it is the F4 that has a poor impedance, and that's when we would want to check that electrode. Spikes versus seizure activity. Spikes and sharps, sharp waves may represent seizure activity or interectal activity in individuals with epilepsy or a predisposition towards epilepsy. Seizures are an abnormal brain activity characterized by excessive synchronized rhythmic discharges of a population of neurons. So here we are looking at our interictal spikes over the left anterior temporal region versus seizure activity over the left frontal. EEG, what are you monitoring? For a carotid endorectomy procedure, we want to see if the EEG activity in alpha and beta ranges beforehand. Changes from the stage in EEG during clamping is highly sensitive and specific to ischemia. This can be achieved with around a one MAC of inhalation agents without intravenous anesthetics. During aneurysm clippings, on the other hand, brain protection is the goal of monitoring. When the brain is in burst suppression, and even more so when isoelectric, there is less metabolic activity demand. This can be easily achieved through boluses or titrated infusion of intravenous anesthetics. So if you're doing these clippings and you're looking for neuroprotection, so 
your goal there is to make sure you stay in a very slow activity, a slow brain activity, so it doesn't have the same metabolic demand when they clip that aneurysm. There's papers out by Doi Amata that show that there is a significant difference between isoelectric and burst suppression, whereas you will have a much lower metabolic activity when you're in isoelectric. So during these cases, when you start to see any kind of burst suppression, that's when you let the anesthetic know. Anesthesiologists know that we are starting to see some activity. Could you increase the uh, usually propofol perfusion or give another bolus, whatever it is they're, they're doing at that point? Filter settings. The frequency that we are monitoring is from delta to beta, which is about 1 to 35 hertz in frequencies. It should make sense that the filter settings bandwidth is typically set at 1 to 70 or double the fastest frequency we want to collect. The amplitude of EEG is about 10 to 50 microvolts. Channel pair combinations for raw EEG with a 100% sensitivity and specificity. So I think this is the Croft uh, study where when they had these uh, montage up here in the upper left-hand corner, they had a perfect record, right? 100% sensitivity and specificity for calling a change that was significant for ischemia, and then they didn't miss anything either. So the alarm criteria that they use is a significant change in raw EG were defined as a greater than 50% decrease in the amplitude of the 8 to 15 hertz activity, or that fast alpha slow beta activity. It covers the middle cerebral artery distribution and watershed zones, or the frontal parietal and frontal temporal areas. We'll go a little bit more over watershed zones in a second here. Probably not going to be the best choice on a multiple choice test, but I would pick something uh, with more channels if you had that option. So here we have the double banana, anterior to posterior, so FC to T3, F3 to C3, F4 to C4, four, or F8 to T4, as well as the F3 to C3, T3 to T5. And you can see we're covering this middle cerebral uh, area. Watershed zones in the brain. Watershed infarcts occur at the border zones between major cerebral arterials, arterial territories as a result of hy hypoperfusion. There are two patterns of border zone infarcts. First is the cortical border zone infarct. Infarction of the cortex and adjacent subcortical white matter located at the border zone of the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, as we see in the picture here. Red is your ACA or, or your anterior cerebral artery distribution area. Yellow is your MCA. Green is your PCA. And we can see these borderline areas, the ones that, cover, that are uh, in between the two areas, is the most likely or the, the most prone to injury during times of ischemia. And that's because the branches of the arterias are, are so small and the pressure getting into those areas is much less. So you need an increase in pressure to perfuse those areas. Internal border zone infarcts. Infarctions of the deep white matter of the border zone located in the lenticular striae perforators and the deep penetrating cortical branches of the MCA or the border, border zone of the deep, wider, deep white matter branches of the MCA and ACA. So if we have our internal carotid here, remember that the middle cerebral artery is pretty much an extension of the MCA. As we see here, we have this one little branch, this A1 branch. This is coming off to become your anterior cerebral artery. And then we have what's called the M1 branch of the middle cerebral artery, which is this horizontal uh, arterial branch. If we're doing uh, TCD, we have our probe out on the side here, insinating the artery going this way, and we're measuring blood flow velocity as it comes towards the probe. <laughs> now you can see these lenticular stri arteries go into the deep uh, nuclei of the brain. This is a reason why we incorporate SSCPs along with our EEGs in times, uh, and during these carotid endorectomies. The EEGs is just monitoring out here, this distal branches of the uh, M2 branch of the MCA. But if something happens and we have some uh, ischemic event subcortically, the EGs aren't, aren't going to be able to uh, record that because they only record the most distal brain activity. Our SSCPs have to go through the internal capsule before we get our cortical uh, N20 channel or N20 generator. So if we see a loss of that, 
we could be picking up a deep uh, ischemic problem as well. Alarm criteria for carotid endarotomy and EEGs. There is no established alarm criteria, but most follow similar concepts. Changes in amplitude, changes in frequency, and changes in activity. So a mild change, mild changes seen are an increase in delta and mild decreases in alpha beta. So when you start to see some delta wave intrusion or some theta wave intrusion, and some of the alpha and beta waves are falling off, this is your mild changes. Moderate changes are an increase in delta and a loss of alpha beta. Severe is burst suppression and isoelectric. 50% uh, decrease in amplitude of the 8 to 15 bandwidth or the alpha beta, uh, fast alpha slow beta bandwidth is a significant change as well. Burst suppression is considered severe and isoelectric even more severe. So these are different criteria that are kind of given. Um, this is the one that's borderline, these, these mild slowing changes. And then we'll see in a second here how you would handle that. Get all. So this is my uh, recommendations. If they put a picture of an EEG up on the your screen and they say, all right, this makes some assessment of what's going on. Like I said in other videos, they're notorious for putting up horrible looking images, poor quality. Uh, not what you're used to seeing, different referent, or different montages in, in the whole nine yards. So if they put an EEG pattern up there, first thing you want to do is look at the channels being monitored. You want to make sure you know which area is frontal, which area is parietal, what's temporal, you know, central and occipital, and you want to be able to know what's left versus right. So we've gone through the first two here. So now we know the territories that are being monitored, as well as how many channels are, are up there. So remember, if there's only four, then we're not looking for seizure activity or something like that. We're looking for gross ischemic changes. If we're if they have 21 electrodes, then you know you can find pretty much anything you're looking for for as far as a, a test bank answer goes. Then you're going to look at the pattern of the montage. Are we looking at a bipolar or referential? If we're looking for bipolar, do we see anything that has any kind of phase inver uh, inversion? like we would see in uh, some kind of seizure pattern or something. If it's if we're seeing referential, do we see anything where we have a, a, an amplification of amplitude that's similar in different channels being referenced to each other differently, uh, but it's, it's similar, it's present in each pattern. Then we want to scroll our eyes down to the bottom of the page. We want to look at the sensitivity and the paper speed. Does this seem reasonable? Uh, one thing that they might try to trick you up on is they have the display gain horrible and it's uh, you you can't see the amp the amplitudes of the waves very good and it just looks like isoelectric potential but it's really just a problem with the gain so make sure that the gain is appropriate to where you should be able to see the potentials you want to look for any comments or anything that's posted on that picture so every once in a while you'll see a straight line drawn through it and it'll say clamp time or clamp here. Uh, they're they're kind of hinting or, or leading to what you should be looking at before and after. So look for those different comments that are made on the picture itself. And then finally, that's when you look at the wave, uh, but only the left side of the traces. Uh, so how does it look, left versus right, frontal versus parietal, frequency of waves, size of amplitude, any asymmetries or global patterns. So this way you're making sure you know you're looking at the left side and you're working your way through the lobes. Uh, and then once you go with the left side, you check the right side and work your way through the lobes. Once you're done with that, then you want to uh, assess the race of the traces, assess all the traces doing that same pattern. But after that's done, look back up at the screen and look at the very left side of the screen versus the very right side of the screen. The very left side is the, the beginning of the traces. So you want to see what everything looked like uh, comparatively on the left side versus how they look comparatively on the right side and then compare the left versus right. So if you're looking for any kind of slowing or anything like that that might be mild in nature, it's easiest to see when you compare the very left side to the right side. So if you kind of follow that pecking order, you probably shouldn't miss or get confused or, or not fall into their tricks. All right, so this is an example. A lot of traces there and uh, doesn't look like anything's jumping off the screen, really. 
So if we do our pecking order, we look at our traces, we find where's our left versus our right, where's our frontal, where's our temporal. Uh, we see the odd numbers here, the even here, odd here, even there. So it's kind of uh, skipping. It goes, you know, left, right, left, right. And then, but it's going from anterior to posterior on this recording. <coughs> we see that we have a, a line drawn here. So that's kind of something tipping us off. Our display gain and all that looks reasonable. Um, the bottom trace here is our EKG artifact. So we want to make sure we, we note that in case that's what they're uh, looking for and it kind of replicates accordingly with that EKG artifact. If we look at our frontal versus temporal, we're making assessments here, frontal versus temporal, and then the left side versus the right side, frontal versus temporal. It looks a little bit slower here, for instance. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at our left versus right side, especially according to this line here, which is the time of clamp. So when we go through that whole process, do we see any significant slowing? If so, which side or is it global? If so, what lobes? What's your recommendation that you're going to be giving? So the easiest to do on this, we had this line, it's clamp time. So we know we want to look at any changes in frequency and amplitude sizes. So if we're looking at the very left side, we see the activity here, we look for the right side over here, we can see that there is some slowing uh, and it's greater on one side versus the, other, the next and it's greater in the lobe. So that's a borderline change. I'd let the surgeon know that there are minimal changes in the right side. If the blood pressure or mean arterial pressure is low, I suggest starting there. At this point, it's probably not worth risking problems due to a shunt, but it's a close call. So. If you see this, we can see it really prominent right there. We, we see this changing in patterns. The first thing you should do is let's let's try something palliative. Let's uh, not do a, a, another surgical maneuver that's risky in itself. Let's increase the mean arterial pressure. And then this is probably what they did here. And we start to see a little bit of improvement. And that is less, you know, we, we see the uh, fast activity falling off. We see some theta. Uh, wave activity so the slowing is starting to become more prominent and then they make some changes and then we start to see some of that uh, alpha wave coming back <clears throat> okay same thing we go through all the steps uh, we'll fast forward a little bit more instead of going over it all again but this does have significant slowing if so which side is it global if so which lobes and what's your recommendation so go ahead and pause the video look it over make your judgment call Okay, we're back. That's more severe slowing in the right frontal areas. You can see a significant loss of anesthetic induced fast waves and an increase in slower waves. The amplitudes are decreasing as time goes by as well. I let the surgeon know this is a significant change. So he's made the assumption or the uh, interpretation that the amount of fast activity has dropped off by 50% or greater, and as well as the amplitude of that fast activity has decreased by 50% or greater. We see it in these F channels, the frontal channels, and we see it more prominent on the even numbers of the right side, although the left side as well is showing some slowing. Um, and then we see cross clamping. They actually labeled this picture better than the last one. Okay, again, what do you see? Any difference right to left, anterior to posterior? What might cause something like this at a time like this? And what should you do? So go ahead and pause the video and make your interpretation. Okay, going forward. The clamp just came off and there's significant slowing globally. It can't be from an emboli. Remember an emboli would lodge somewhere. It, it would cause some kind of unilateral change unless there was some ridiculous anatomical variation, but that's got to be low on our probability stamp, uh, uh, differential area. It could be due to hyper reperfusion, but that's more likely an ipsilateral problem. My guess would be that anesthetic is switching up their protocol to deal with the fact that the clamp is off. They usually try to lower the blood pressure at this point. Maybe the patient dropped too low and they're trying to increase the blood pressure by increasing an inhalational agent. So because we're seeing this gross bilateral change, it's pretty symmetrical <clears throat> and it has a, a pretty good onset of when it started, which is you know, pretty far out or not too far out, I guess they don't have a time stamped here, but 
it's not immediate or it's probably not within that first you know 10 to 20 seconds <clears throat> there's probably something that they did anesthetically and the clamp is off so if something was going to happen when they take the clamp off chances are it would happen right away like a clock going loose chances are those things are uh ipsilateral or usually ipsilateral but usually unilateral like a hyper reperfusion problem or uh emboli that broke off but because we have this global changes we have to think what can cause global changes is this patient in left side burst suppression or right side isoelectric go ahead and pause the video okay moving on wow that's not the sensitivity setting i would expect for a carotid case that would miss too much of the fast activity we would like to see with the steady state anesthesia that looks like seizure activity happening on the left it looks frontally dominant too maybe this was a motor mapping case so we have activity here this is not isoelectric it's just the uh, gain settings they have on there is not appropriate to be able to depict if this is alpha versus beta you can see some of the activity there but it's not very prominent they probably did that to lower the amplitude activity so they could put this all on the screen where it's not overlapping and assess this activity here which is most likely seizure activity uh, we know it's not burst suppression because it's unilateral as well burst suppression would be global a metabolic change should you tell the surgeon and or the anesthesiologist anything go ahead and pause the video make your assessment okay we're back that's muscle artifact note the sharp spike-like waves of varying amplitudes if they can't already tell you need to let them know the patient is waking or might move we're starting to see some of this activity that's more prominent in the frontal areas uh, you, know, you get that huge frontalis muscle it's giving off a lot of facial expression and uh, it's a, a lot of emg activity so this could be an early sign that the patient is not as deep as uh, you would like them to be or the patient's waking up and the surgery's over and you say hey the patient's about to wake up So blood supply to the brain. The MCA is 80% of the blood supply to the cortex. So that's a, a large amount of blood, which is uh, one of the reasons why some groups only uh, monitor SSCPs from the upper extremity, uh, just because it, we're looking for kind of gross changes of ischemia, as well as the fact that uh, the MCA is the, an extension off of the internal carotid artery. If you have some kind of placking, it will most likely go through there and not through the ACA. <clears throat> if we look at our circle wheels here, we'll kind of follow some of the patterns. And if we identify first the vertebral arteries, this is what we would call our posterior circulation. This is what's coming up back in the spinal area, up into the brain stem, and then comes into this one segment of the, as the basal artery. The basal artery then branches off into the PCA, there we go right here and then this makes this is the bottom half of the circle coming up from the neck area is our anterior portion or internal carotid artery which continues on as our middle cerebral artery and then branches off in our anterior and this is the uh, front side of our circle of wheels here you need to be able to draw this out and know uh, which area is coming from where and what is the supply and if we had a clot in this area what part of the brain would be affected um, there's just a, a lot of questions that can come off of the circle willis so this is a, a pretty prominent picture of what the circus willis is but it's it's flat in nature so it doesn't really give you the best uh, depiction of anterior and posterior circulation so that's why i like this second picture next to it we see the spinal area here with our vertebral arteries coming from the posterior anterior we see our internal carotid coming up in the top part uh, of our circle willis the posterior at the bottom part of the circle willis so it just shows a, a good uh, picture here of anterior and posterior circulation incidence of ischemia and carotids the clamp related changes have been reported in nine to or about 10 to 35 percent so when you're looking to see how often does a change happen in egs it's about 10 one in 10 is about the uh, appropriate number to say 
of changes appear within the first minute and 69% appear within the first 20 seconds. So when you clamp, you have a high probability of a pretty sudden change. Higher incidence of stroke due to shunt placement uh, makes the neuromonitoring important. And then we just have some more pictures here of showing slowing, slowing, slowing. And again, slowing and loss of amplitudes. Uh, this is a picture of the actual procedure where they go and they put some tie loops around <clears throat> and then they put their clamp on and clamp on. According to baselines, a pre-induction, pre-medicated baseline should be recorded in order to assess any pre-existing asymmetries or, or abnormalities. This is what I stated before, uh, what's in the guidelines. I question its usefulness, but for the test, that's what the guidelines say. You should have at least 10 minute baseline pre-clamp recording while anesthetized is essential to appreciate any clamp associated changes. So when you're setting your baselines, you wanna have a good 10 minutes of unaffected anesthesia, no artifact, your impedance is good. So you want, you gotta really work to get something uh, good up to that point. Your baselines don't start when surgery starts. Your baselines start 10 minutes before they clamp. Patients with prior strokes have uh, may have focal slowing. This should be noted prior to clamping. Uh, this is about the time heparin is given to thin out the patient's blood. So they usually that happens about four to five minutes before they, they put the clamp on. The surgeon will look over and say, can I get a, however much of heparin? You want to note that in your document, say heparin given, and that's when you're really uh, ready to start assessing things. Using a look back function or a printout of the baseline to record raw EG for changes. So some programs like Cadwell will give you this look back function you can use as a baseline for your EEGs. Others uh, like the Eclipse don't have it as a function, at least the older ones don't. I don't know what their new ones have. Uh, so you wanna take a, uh, a screenshot of something and then have that PDF you know, down out of the way or, or in a small box off to the side, at least, so you can look at it and reference it. Especially if you remember some of those examples I gave, some of them are pretty uh, subtle changes that can happen. And you might miss something because you're, it's slowly happening, happening as it progresses. And then, you know, to, the, to your eye, it doesn't look like there's anything significant, but if you had a baseline to, to look, at it, look at it against, you would say, okay, that is something happening that has raised the blood pressure, whatever you might do at that point. <clears throat> a 10 minute period following restoration of blood flow upon, upon clamp release is also required to ensure that any intraoperative changes has been resolved. So you saw that one picture, clamp off, anesthesia, put on some high gas, and we saw some slowing right away. So at that point, if anything happens afterwards, we're, we're useless. We can't tell any difference. So it's recommended you should have at least 10 minutes of recording good waveforms after the clamp is released. Uh, and then you know talk to your anesthesia team about that as well. Because uh, they're gonna be kind of anxious. They're gonna be, wanna be able to wake the patient up and see that they're moving uh, after the procedure. <clears throat> so they're gonna wanna change their anesthesia as soon as you'll let them. But 10 minutes is your minimum. Protamine is typically given at this point to reverse the effects of heparin. That's just a, another anesthetic name you need to know. Protamine reverses heparin. Heparin uh, makes the blood thinner. Post-medication EEG unmask asymmetry. So here's a picture uh, where the EEG in a patient with a right cerebral infarct uh, during wakefulness on the left side and then after anesthesia with halothane and nitric oxide. There is anesthetic Activated right hemisphere slowing. Note the absence of any focal abnormality during the awake EEG. So this larger, slower amplitude in the ox, but that's normal. Remember we said uh, we have to know which are prominent in our awake person. But then when we look at our left versus right, we can see some loss of amplitude and some slowing uh, that was not present during the awake, but is now uh, present after anesthesia has been given. A carotid shunt. A uh, shunt is placed when the IOMJ, IOM changes are seen after clamping. Severe changes usually means compromise of collateral blood flow. After the shunt placement, focal changes in the raw EEG typically resolve in two to seven minutes. I've seen it happen a lot quicker than that, but uh, 
right around that that territory mark. You know, you don't freak out, but that's when you should see it uh, resolve. Unilateral changes happen twice as bilateral changes, so you can have bilateral changes after they clamp an artery um, because this is not an, an emboli that's breaking off and going somewhere downstream. This is, you know, the downstream blood flow, and usually when people have a stenosis in one carotid, they probably have it in a lot of other major vessels. So depending on how this person's uh, has adapted to those levels of stenosis, they may be very reliant upon that artery that is now being clamped by the surgeon. And that might be true for both the ipsilateral and contralateral side. Abrupt changes uh, are seen with uh, emboli and slower is due to hemodynamic causes. A patch graft may be used to prevent restenosis. So if we see in the lower picture here, we see all these uh, little stitches in there. And what they've done is put a bovine patch in there that allows for the vessel to remain uh, fuller. If they didn't use a bovine patch, they would do a primary closure where they would just sew the artery back upon itself, which makes the uh, tube or lumen uh, a lot thinner. And so the chances of restenosis or uh, getting clogged up again is, is a lot higher. The downside of the patch is it, it takes longer to put it in there surgically. Well, they're, they're still under clamps. So they, there's a lot of different things in the literature that say, should you, you know, do you use the patch or not use the patch for a time of, uh, for the sake of time? Should you use neuromonitoring or should you just uh, go in there quickly, clean out the carotid, close it up, and then be on, your, on with your way and wake them up and, and do a test? You know, there's it's still very variable in the literature as to what is the actual best. It's it's right now it seems like it's kind of a push. Ischemic penumbra zone. Cerebral infarct depend on both degree and duration of ischemia. There's an uh, an area of ischemic non-functioning non-infarct neural tissue that can avoid damage if revascularization occurs in a timely fashion. So if you have an area infarcted brain around that area is this, uh, it's still ischemic, but it's non infarcted and it's not functioning. So when you have these moments of ischemia, the first thing that will fail is function. That's your brain's uh, or your body's own protective uh, mechanism. So if it's not having enough blood supply, first thing it does is it shuts down. By shutting down, it becomes less metabolically active and is more prone to survive this insult. On EEG, we depict, or even SSCP, we depict this as a loss of amplitude size or, or some kind of significant change. If we restore blood flow to that area, we'll restore function, and we never lost the structural integrity. There's never that kind of uh, infarcted problem, and that area of tissue will then be preserved, and it's like nothing happened. <clears throat> That's not the same of uh, the infarcted tissue, which has both functional and now structural changes to where we have cell apoptosis and the, uh, cell neuronal death and then placking and, and the whole cascading event. After we restore blood, that area is damaged, uh, that tissue is not going to be able to regenerate, and that is our stroke or infar infarcted brain area. Uh, the area of peri-infarct tissue is believed to be at, a, at two thresholds. The upper threshold of electrical failure, yet structurally vi uh, vi structural viability, and the lower threshold of energy and ionic failure that uh, precedes neuronal death. So the first area is an area where it's lost function, EEGs look bad, SSPs look bad, uh, and that brain area can probably survive in that zone for an infinite amount of time. It's, it's surviving, it's just not functioning. The next level is an area of functional loss. Structural integrity is still intact, it's still fine, but it's, it's on a timer. Uh, it can only withstand that level of blood perfusion for a certain amount of time, and that amount of time is dependent on a bunch of different factors that makes it impossible to predict exactly how long that's gonna be. So that, the clock is ticking, so when we see changes on EEGs, we can't tell if it's in an area that's completely going to die, uh, you know, it's got no blood flow, or we can't tell if it's an area of low blood flow where function is lost, structural integrity is on a timer, 
or if it's an area of low blood flow where function is lost, but it's just kind of hibernating, it'll be fine. Whenever we get around to reperfusing it, we can't tell off our, our potential. So that's why we need fast acquisition. Uh, of, that's why raw EEG works very well. Uh, that's why we don't want to have a, a thousand sweeps on our SSCPs. If we can get it collected in 50 to 100, that's all the better because time is of the essence. The higher the metabolic demand, the shorter the ischemic penumbra, uh, the shorter that ischemic penumbra lasts or the gray matter, medications on board, the temperature of brain, that's the different uh, metabolic effects that determine how long that this ischemic penumbra can go on without causing actual structural damage. <clears throat> so we have these different terms. Uh, first is ischemic penlucida zone. This uh, another area in the zone of non-functioning, non-infarct, physically intact neurons. These are at a level of blood flow that will allow them to recover even if intervention fails. So this is the one where they're just kind of hibernating and hanging out. The penumbra area is time dependent, while the penlucida is not. The regional cerebral blood flow levels are 18 to 23 milliliters per 100 grams per minute, and that's from xenon testing. Normal cerebral blood flow is about 50 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. And if demand is normal, then the neuronal function uh, does not begin to be impaired until it falls right around 25 uh, milliliters per 100 grams per minute. Uh, so that's our ischemic area. And the awake human or primate neurons become completely electrically dysfunctional right around 15 milliliters per 100 grams per minute at 10. Uh, the cell membranes become dysfunctional if the decreased flow continues, uh, cell death uh, will occur or infarction. So here on the left is our chart. It's our useful chart. Uh, there's no changes if greater than 23 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. Minor changes in that 19 to 23, and a shunt is usually needed at 18. So that's uh, dependent upon what our EEGs will show and what our SSCPs will show. So right around this 18 is kind of like the early warning signs for EEG uh, or an, an SSP. And we'll, I think we'll look at those levels a little bit more. But So here we see on the top part is Pellucida. This is the hibernating area where we don't need to get any kind of function or uh, blood supply back. And it can go on indefinitely without having kind of uh, cell damage. Penumbra, this is the ticking time bomb where if we have lower blood flow, a shorter duration, we can last without having cell apoptosis or cell death versus a uh, more blood flow, we can long, last longer amounts of time uh, versus tissue that's infarct. And we can see that a very small percentage of it is going to get infarcted pretty soon. Uh, so your brain can last about four minutes of no flow blood flow before infarction actually starts to take place. And well, this is measured in hours also, that should be noted. So EEG in penlucida and penumbra zones. We have a 50 year old before clamping, after clamping, and four minutes after uh, shunting. Another patient on the right, same deal. And on the left, same deal. Here we're looking at the cerebral blood flow, the time it takes, and then how long till after shunting. So we can see that the lower cerebral blood flow, the worse our EEG are gonna look. <clears throat> and how, uh, the time it takes to get to that point is much uh, sooner. So EEG findings in three patients with significant reduction in cerebral blood flow related to carotid clamping. Note that the severity of EEG alterations correlates with cerebral blood flow measurement. The EEG alterations were reversible as demonstrated by recordings after shunting. So I think I already said this, how long can the brain maintain uh, no blood flow? About four minutes, but they will be able to withstand up to one hour at this low blood flow level of 15 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. And also your anesthetics play a role on that as well. Uh, remember, some of them are, are neuroprotective, so you might have a longer uh, survival rate under these anesthetics than somebody that is not under any anesthetics. What are the critical blood flow levels that people need to maintain a normal EEG? Uh, 35 to 40% of normal or 18 to 20 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. 
What level of blood flow is consistent with cerebral ischemia? 10 milliliters per 100 grams per minute, but that also depends on other, other metabolic factors that can be manipulated in the operating room. But that's kind of your uh, golden number there if they're going to be asking you these type of questions. All right, moving on. The fast Fourier transformer. This can be used to take a signal and decompose decompose it a, a signal and decompose it into a sinusoidal wave each having different frequencies and amplitude the squared amplitude of each sinusoidal is per, is proportional to the power of the signal at that frequency plotting these values against frequency produces an estimate of the power spectrum of the original signal for example if you have a one second long uh, epoch having maximum peak-to-peak -peak amplitudes of 9 microvolts. The FFT analysis decomposes the signal into three sine waves having frequencies of 4, 7, and 11 hertz and the respective amplitudes of 12, 6, and 3 microvolts. Plotting these square wave values of the magnitude against frequency yields an estimate of the signal's power spectrum. So here we have our raw EEG. goes through our fast Fourier transform pulls out the three different uh, waves that we see and the uh, amplitudes accordingly and plots it on this graph after putting it through uh, the, the squared value uh, calculation. And this gives, this is a, a picture depicting the power spectrum of a, sing, uh, of a single sinusoidal wave. Compressed spectral array versus color density spectral array. So the CSA, or the Compressed Spectral Array, presents the array of power versus frequency versus time. The DSA presents the same data as can be grayscaled uh, shaded plot, or it can be a color as well. So here we have our mountainous range, and here we have our grayscale plots or dots. The DSA is more compact, whereas the CSA permits better resolution of power or amplitude data. So here we're seeing a dark, darker, more uh, dots versus this larger amplitude, which for me at least is easier to, to depict for amplitude size. The DSA have a relative power values are, are indicated with smaller or larger dots. The CSA displayed in voltage or power in the y-axis with frequency in the x-axis. So this is the frequency in hertz of the waveforms we're collecting. So if we're looking for our fast alpha slow uh, beta, we're looking for something in this wave here, which we finally get to at this point. The power display enhances large peaks and attenuates smaller amplitude peaks. Power is proportional to the voltage squared. So the reason why this should be used as a backup to raw EEG when we're determining uh, if we need to shunt or, or whatever it is we're doing for the case is this last sentence here. The power display enhances large peaks and attenuates smaller amplitude peaks. It's because of this uh, that we square the value of it and, and find these power outputs. Uh, we will miss these small attenuated peaks and can sometimes mask subtle changes uh, that you'll pick up on raw EEG that you will not on these uh, CSAs and DSAs. Frequency of the spectrum or the EEG spectrum, the peak power frequency. This is the frequency of the largest power component. The spectral edge frequency, this is the one that most people use. The largest frequency at which a significant amount of power is present is called the spectral edge frequency. Below this frequency, 97% of the power uh, total power is captured, so it kind of gets rid of that last 3%. The median power frequency, this is a frequency at which 50% of the total power is contained in lower frequencies and 50% the power is contained in higher frequencies. Changes in spectral edge frequency greater than 50% or a loss greater than 75% of the total power has been reported as significant changes. Spectral edge frequency may remain unchanged in instances where small amounts of high frequency artifact contaminate the signal. They may also miss mild ischemic changes due to, uh, I got it clipped off, but due to that uh, calculation, of the squaring of the power that I, I spoke of before. So here we have our power and our frequency on our X and Y axis. Here we have our MPF or median power. So this is half, this is half. Here we have the power peak frequency or the highest peak. 
and here we have our spectral edge frequency. This is the one that we typically use. But definitely know the definition, and it makes it easier in your mind if you can remember this image. Power spectral edge, frequency at which a given percentage of power exists in the EEG PSE should be set to a value placing placing it at the upper edge of the alpha band. If predominant frequency of EEG shifts to slower frequencies with loss of fast frequencies as seen in ischemia, the PSA should shift to the left. Power upward deflection frequency is a linear display across each epoch. So power and frequency plotted over time. Here we have the 90% spectral edge frequency and our total EEG power on this example here. The power density spectrum of EEG signal from figure 6 is uh, the, the pale line there. The position of the 90% spectral edge, spectral edge frequency is at 8.2 hertz. If we see moments of ischemia, we will see it shift to the left. We, might, we typically will also see that with a loss of these amplitude sides here. This is our alpha band, this 8 to 12, which we see our uh, spectral edge frequency in, in this diagram. Burst suppression ratio. The burst suppression ratio, or BSR, is a time, do time domain EEG pattern developed to quantify this phenomena. To calculate this parameter, suppression is recorded as those periods longer than 0.5 seconds during which the EEG voltage does not exceed approximately or uh, or it's an able or non-stationary nature of the burst suppression the BSR should be should be averaged over at least 60 seconds or a minute used to better estimate the depth of anesthesia so here we have our activity and then we have this moment of suppression and then more activity and we are going to create a ratio out of that and uh, it needs to be in order to be something useful, it needs to be less than 5 microvolts and greater than 0.5 seconds in order to uh, call that a moment of suppression. EEG and SSCP are not without their faults. EEG may miss subcortical problems, while SSCPs may miss pre-rolandic pre problems or, or the frontal lobe problems. EEGs are more prone to change in anesthesia and blood, blood pressure, becoming unreliable with birth suppression. While SSCPs can take a longer time to collect if artifact requires you to increase your reps needed to average out the noise. SSCPs might be better picking up slower hemo hemodynamic changes in EEG, while EEGs may be better at picking up more focal changes. So what will go first with ischemia, EEGs or SSCPs? The EEG penumbra range is 10 to 15. Uh, milliliters per hundred grams per minute, and SSCPs are slightly higher and narrower at 14 to 16. It is because SSCPs become non-functional, although structurally intact at higher regional cerebral blood flow, that you will see changes there first. Farber's 1988 paper demonstrated that SSCP changes will usually be seen one to two minutes earlier than EEGs. But remember that it takes time to collect an SSCP, and if these changes are not these slow hemodynamic changes, but are, more, but are a more rapidly changing uh, effect, like through an emboli or something, chances are you'll pick it up on EEG because that is a continuous recording versus the, uh, an evoked response. We're doing SSCPs2 on this case, which is causing a change in brain activity due to stimulation. Why doesn't, the, why doesn't this change our EEGs? Uh, we already saw this picture here, but it has to do with the fact that it's less time and smaller amplitudes than what we record on our EEG, so therefore it's unaffected. I know we're using both SSCP and EEG, but which, which one's better? EEGs are the gold standard for carotids, and it's what all other modalities are measured against. Other authors have suggested that SSCP may actually be better, like LAM 1991. Uh, they show that EEGs have a sensitivity of 50% and a specificity of 92, while SSCPs were better with a sensitivity of 100 and specificity of 94. Uh, make sure you are able to define and tell the difference between uh, sensitivity and specificity. For the exam, I, I wrote a long blog post on this and uh, went into great detail, so it's within that 30 days of neuromonitoring period, so make sure you check that out.
actually, it's, I think it's in the first week of it. Uh, sensitivity rules out problems. So if a test is negative, they don't have it. And specificity rules in problems. So if they have the test is positive, they have that problem. And that is it for this CNIM crash course. Um, I am planning on sending stuff out in the email. So if you signed up, which you should have, on that uh, landing page for the CNIM crash course, make sure you check your email box for additional emails for me. I'll be sending out some, uh, some other study material to make sure that uh, you have what you need to pass the CNM. All right, thanks for listening. Make sure you spread the word and let other people know about it. It's free, uh, so pay it forward. Thank you.